Go on, Olivier. This was your idea. This was your guest. Uh, you kick it off. Don't, don't put so much pressure on me, my friend. But uh, I'm, I'm really glad, actually, to, to have you, Oliver, on this... How do you call this, Tim? Show? Podcast? Experiment? Uh, failure? Uh, uh, yeah, just uh, a travesty. Travesty, I think, is the best <laughs> word. <laughs> travesty of a podcast, okay. Yes. So... Uh, I don't want to, to talk too much of myself because this is what is your specialty, Tim. You're talking too much about yourself. You don't, you, uh, you don't let any room for the guests. Right? True. Yes. But at some point, I decided to do some coaching, right? And uh, to become certified as a coach and to do a real certification, not like yours, Tim, but a real <laughs> certification with a CTI and follow the, one of the, of, of the best course, uh, which is an 18-month course, training course. And I came to this decision because there was some, some uh, you know, um, I was searching for, 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 for stuff in my life, you know, for some meaning, right? And before that, uh, when I took this de decision, I said, well, you know what? I should also read some books because I never read any books about self-help. Can you imagine that, Tim? I never read any books, even your books, right? So I went to this big library in Dubai. What are you saying? No, you, do, you don't care. Okay. Oh, no, no, I wasn't. I was saying you complete bastard. I sent you a copy. You never read it. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Okay, so just to, to make this long story short. So I'm searching desperately because I say, yes, I will learn about self-help. I will learn about, how about helping people, right? So I go to, with this objective in my head. I go to, to the Dubai Mall, which is one of the biggest malls in the world. And I, I go to this book, bookstore, which is one of the biggest bookstores in the world as well. And I go to the self-help section, and you can imagine there was, I think, I don't know, a million books over there. And shit, I'm saying, what should I buy? What should I buy? You know, and I see all these books with these nice covers and stuff. And I think this is the universe, or I don't know, random luck or anything or coincidence. But I just pick one random book, and this is, I don't know if you see a screen, but this is your book, Oliver. This is your book, The Antidote. And one thing that really attracted to me was on the cover, it was saying happiness for people who can't stand positive thinking. And I bought the, the book in a second. I bought it and I just loved it because one thing is for sure. I just, I just, I just, I, 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 I cannot stand positive thinking. That was my thing. So, and I even did a review of your book. I'm sure you never read it, but that's, this, is, this is it. So I'm so glad to have you on board, Oliver. Uh, thank and, thank and you very just, much I for asking me. I can't wait for you to speak now. Yes. And, not, and, not me, and, and I need to shut up now. Okay, so no, no, I, I'm, just, I'm, just I'm, I'm very glad <laughs> for, the, uh, for, the, for the invitation. And I, I think that subtitle on the book does work to um, uh, connect me to my people, you know, my uh, fellow skeptics pessimists and and uh people prone to grumbling uh, uh around the around the planet so if that's what was happening there i'm, I'm glad that it worked oh so only i can hear a big bip yes but, sorry uh, about that yeah. so i will make sure that that doesn't happen uh. that was my colostomy bag <laughs> filling up just reminding me to change it sorry about that <laughs> <laughs> so i'm know, part of it Oh, I'm so part so of your people. I'm part of your people, and I think Tim also is part of, of of your people as well because he can't stand positive thinking, right, Tim? Well, um, that's not technically. I, I wouldn't say I was necessarily part of Oliver's people because I followed I followed the bastard on Twitter. And he never followed me back, and I just feel crushed now. Um, I better I know, better rectify but, that. Uh, sorry, I better rectify that. Yeah, don't worry. Carry on. Yeah. Carry on. Uh, all you'll get is sarcasm, uh, profanity, and um, digs at the uh, political right on my Twitter stream. So I shouldn't look for any inspiration, but that might be that might be cool with you. <laughs> sounds sounds uh, excellent. No, no, carry on. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's interesting because when 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 Olivia mentioned you, immediately I thought, I know that guy. I, I know that guy, and I, I used to be a. A Guardian reader. It's great to have another Brit on the on the call, so we can ridicule Olivier and his ridiculous France accent even more. Um, <laughs> and, and I agree. So Olivier just said, "Yeah, I'm against positive thinking." I'm actually not really against positive thinking, but I'm against 
the, and, and, and I'm going to ask you if this is what the book talks about, which if I was a great host, I'd have gone and read the book, but I am going to go by it now because it looks interesting, but I only started researching last night. Um, it's this belief that that's all you need, you know, and it's been proven again and again and again. You know, one of the things that bugs me when I see on Twitter is people putting something like, it takes as much energy to have a positive thought as it does a negative one, which is complete bullshit. Mm-hmm. Especially if you're a negative thinker, because you get into patterns of thinking, right, right, and it actually you have to use the conscious mind to then have a positive thought. And it takes more effort, and it's difficult for people because we're hardwired for danger. So, you know, I, I don't want to try and put your book in a nutshell when I've never read it, and you're the author. But it's, it, that's probably the biggest stretch any interviewer has ever gone. Uh, I haven't read this book, and but is, that, is this what it's about? You're, you're alarmingly on the right tracks, so no, I'll, I'll happily. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's slightly depressing, in okay, fact. Cool. If you can, uh, if you can uh, summarise it so well without reading it, it, uh, it calls uh, it calls book writing into question, really, doesn't it? Um, I think that um, it's it's. I mean, that's that makes me think of two things. Firstly, yes, I think you're totally right. It's this idea that if you ask the universe for what you want, that's what you need to do, and you can you can sit back and eat pizza the rest of the time as long as you've placed that uh, that that order with the cosmos um i'm rude whenever i possibly can be about about uh the book the secret which i think um yes yes basically... we, rip that, we rip that with gay abandon in fact we're trying to get bob proctor on the program just so we can ambush him and take the piss um, anyway carry on I, I feel like you know that 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 idea that that somehow you're going to find a loophole in the laws of physics that you can that you can just that you can just put the request out there and then and then it spares you from doing anything else it's 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 clearly uh ridiculous and and you know it clearly doesn't work i think the the other thing that I'm sort of focusing on in the in the book is is a specific definition of positive thinking, which is you know it's not being optimistic or having high hopes for the world or for yourself. It's it's this idea of trying to use your conscious willpower to control the emotions and the mm. thoughts in your mm-hmm. head, and so deciding that you know the way to be successful at something is first of all to decide that you're going to feel like a success all the time, or the way to get out of feeling down and low or depressed is to, is to decide that you're only going to accept positive thoughts, and it sounds absurd when you spell it out like that, but it's actually kind of an absolutely central part of um, certainly Anglo-American uh, uh, self-help culture for, for, for decades. And, and there's, yeah. just, there's just a huge ton of research that it doesn't work that way, that you basically can't directly control your own thoughts and emotions, that if you try, uh, it, it backfires, you get worse ones. You know, if you're constantly on the lookout for negative mm. thoughts, then all you end up doing is being stressed and anxious and on the lookout for negative thoughts. Um, and, uh, you know, that actually being able to accommodate negative thoughts, to be okay with feeling reluctant or feeling no good or something, is a much more powerful way to be able to move forward than, um, mm-hmm. than telling yourself you've got to have a certain kind of mind state, you know, that whole sort of Tony Robbins uh, thing <laughs> that, uh, that, that, that yeah. really gets in the way. Anyway, yeah. My, my, my hero, my hero, you're just not. Yeah, but you're right. I mean, this goes back right the way to, you yeah. know, Napoleon Hill and... Um, Earl Nightingale and all Jim Rohn and the sort of fart grandfathers of self-development and just battering this message about positive thinking. But there's an even darker side that I'm, I'm sure you touch on in the book, which is that when people believe it and then it doesn't work for them, they think there's something wrong with them and it can actually send them into mm. depression. Right, and, and, right. And positive thinkers ca- can't deal with serious life incidences like this. You can't positive think that, you know, my, my wife last night went to a memorial for a six-month-old baby with one of her friends, a doctor. The baby died of uh, meningitis at six months old. You can't positive think that away. No, and, it, and it's just you know, the effort that people will sometimes put in to try to coax people into thinking positively about tragedies like that is actually just a sign of their own uh, embarrassment with negative emotions, I think, their own... You know, that, that idea that mm. that idea that if someone in the midst of you has had something absolutely terrible happen to you that, to them, there's almost like a pressure to get them to spare you having to see their suffering, which yeah. is just obviously ridiculously selfish. Yeah. 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 That, that, Oliver, seen, sorry, go on, Mark. Yeah, actually, I, I wanted I had a request for Oliver because um, at, 
and I have to apologize because I've misquoted your book so many times on this show. <laughs> it's, it's, I'm, I'm a, I'm a poor, really, you know, and, uh, you know, but anyway, that's, that's us. We are so unprofessional, but I've tr- in the very first episode, I tried to tell the story, what you described at the very beginning of the book about this guy, this, uh, Dr. Robert Schuller and his, yeah. uh, and his, um, yeah. C- can you, can you tell the story? Because this story is so funny and in, it, it grabbed me immediately. Well, oh, yeah, uh, sure. Yeah. No, ab- absolutely. I mean, I I knew um, when I began this this book that I wanted to really try to get into the heart of positive thinking culture as well um, as explore all the alternatives. Um, mm. You know, I, I I didn't go to the get motivated seminar in San Antonio, Texas, in a basketball stadium of fifteen thousand people. I wasn't completely in a state of absolute uh, non bias and neutrality when I when I went. I have to confess, mm. you know, I was sort of going to seek out what I considered to be the extremes of of positive thinking culture. But it was a pretty amazing uh, experience. It was a full day. Uh, keynote speakers, including uh, former President George W. Bush, who told us all about how. <laughs> Being an optimist had, uh, and a positive thinker had caused him to be uh, such a great success. And um, uh, uh, anyway, moving swiftly on. And, um, and, and, and one of the beginning speakers was this guy, Dr. Robert Schuller, who's a very famous veteran self-help author. Uh, he's also the um, founder of the, of the largest church in America constructed entirely out of glass. Um, so that's another claim to fame, and, and he really well, gave us. I, I need to write that down in case it ever comes up in a quiz again. So, <laughs> <for> that. <laughs> and he and he told us, you know, in his opening in his opening brief little talk that basically he he said that thing about how you have to eliminate the word impossible from your vocabulary. Uh, mm. You know, he he he. It's a, he doesn't quite mean it literally, but what he means is, you know. You have to not accept the possibility that you can't do anything, and then you will find that you can do anything that you that you want. Mm. And he gave us, told us these little stories about people who've been very severely injured, but had nevertheless managed to, you know, run uh, triathlons or whatever. And, and talking about how you know, we just had to get rid of the word impossible, and then we wouldn't we wouldn't fail. Um, and it was quite an interesting atmosphere to be there. You know, I'm British. I'm not the kind of person who's going to willingly jump up and cheer after every uh after <laughs> after every slogan like this but it, you sort of get infected actually and i did it a little bit i i found myself going along with mm. uh with the atmosphere <laughs> anyway a few months later after i went to this i was reading the news and i saw that the, the largest cathedral uh the largest church in america constructed entirely out of glass had had uh filed for bankruptcy which ah. as i couldn't resist <laughs> saying in the in the in the book um was evidently a word that he'd forgotten to eliminate from his yeah. vocabulary um, and actually and as an update since I wrote the book I believe it's accurate to say that Get Motivated Seminars which, which ran the whole show has also had to um, file for bankruptcy um, I, I don't, I'm not actually mocking people for their businesses failing I, far from it I would want to make the opposite point and say that you know, being, uh, being, learning to deal with that is, is essential to doing good and meaningful stuff but, but obviously you know, the point I'm trying to make if this kind of approach to unbroken success through positive thinking doesn't even work for the people whose job it is to promote the message mm. of positive thinking then uh, I think we're, we're entitled to be a bit uh, suspicious about whether it's really uh, much of an approach to, uh, <laughs> to, to life okay. Olive you've taken the high ground here let, let me take the not so much low ground but subterranean ground, ground. And I, I will mock people like that not <laughs> not, as, not as human beings, but the fact is, and it's like when I see, you know, law of attraction coaches, experts in law of attraction, they think the rules of business don't apply to them. Right. And, and so it's like, well, I can think, you know, you know if, nothing's, if nothing's impossible to me, then I'm, I'm always going to come out. And it's kind of like, you know, it's the message it sends out to other people is really harmful because you know, at the end of the day there is stuff that's impossible I am not going to represent China in the next Olympics at the female, as a female gymnast it's not possible sure? for that to happen right. Right. you know so let, let's be sensible about it I understand when people say try not to limit yourself but to say that it's like the, the, the expression my, the worst expression in, in the world to me is Failure is not an option. It's like, of course fucking is. It's always right, an option. Right, right, Whatever right. you do. Uh, one other thing that always strikes me from that is that um, 
San Antonio, where this is happening, is uh, was happening is a is a is a very big military town, and and one of the things that you can um, do slightly alarmingly if you're um, at some level of training in the in the uh, the army, I think it is in the U.S. Army, is spend a day at a at a get motivated. Um, motivational seminar which i'm not too sure what i what i think about but anyway the point is there were a large number of uh servicemen and service women in the audience at this thing and i got chatting to some of them afterwards and of course what they will very quickly tell you and this is sort of putting aside the political aspects of whether you think the u.s military has been deployed in the right way or not over the these uh, these last years if you are a working member of the military Refusing to countenance the possibility of failure is the definition of the worst possible thing you could do. There are huge, whole departments in every part of the military dedicated to nothing but playing out, yeah. gaming out failure scenarios. Yeah. And, um, you know, mm-hmm. uh, maybe George Bush should have, uh, should have done some more of that. But, the, <laughs> but, you know, so the actual people on the ground where life and death matters, they don't they don't have a moment's time for this, you know, eliminate the word impossible from your vocabulary. And, 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 and thank goodness they don't. Yeah, that reminded me of Blackadder, the four... Did you watch Blackadder? Yes, but a long time ago. I, I probably won't remember the line. Well, the, fo- the last one where they go over the top and they say, sir, you've forgotten your stick. And he said, yes, of course, I wouldn't want to face the, Russian, uh, the German guns without my stick. <laughs> uh, to beat off the bullets, but anyway, just kind of mind you think about that. They, they do <laughs> ramble, ramble. They do have to do that. I was, I was kind of agreeing, but yeah, no, no, no. I, I, I shot off at a tangent. You know, the thing that also strikes me that about what you said just before about the the, the law of the attraction coaches and all the rest of it is like, I, I, you know, a certain degree of individualism and and ambition and competition is obviously wonderful, but there is something so isolating and individualistic about this positive mm. thinking approach taken to it ex- its extreme the idea that everything that goes wrong for you is your fault for not thinking the right thoughts mm-hmm. that it completely you know not to get overly political but it completely ignores the role of politics and economics and social structures in the fact that some people do start off in a worse position than other people and it is to do right. with things that are bigger than them and it doesn't mean they can't triumph over those conditions but you don't get there by by sort of swallowing this notion that absolutely everything that happens to you is your fault and everything that you succeed in is your um, is 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 your personal uh, success that owes nothing to your wider society or um, or the state, you know. Just just belief, like it, it's very religious. Like just belief and and, um, and and the way you vibrate, obviously, is, is critically important. But don't <laughs> don't forget, it's quantum physics now because Deepak Chopra said, and that quantum physicists have hijacked the term quantum physics. But he's as mad as a hatter, so we'll leave that uh, <laughs> to, to, to one side for one minute. But the thing with the, with the law of attraction for me is the law of attraction coaches is um, they nearly, they're nearly all are struggling to get clients. I've had this conversation. like mm. You're a law of attraction expert, and you can't even fucking attract <laughs> any clients. Right, right, right. Uh, how, how does that work? Tell me. <laughs> Yeah, I always used to, if somebody followed me that was a law of attraction, I saw it on Twitter, and I'm going, I'd say, well, you're obviously not very good at this, so I'm not going to follow you back. Um, and it's just, do, do you not think it's turned into almost like a pseudo-religion? Yes, I think what it is, if you, uh, from the reading I've done into it anyway, is that it takes sort of a few, a few notions from, from, from Buddhism and, and uh, Hindu-derived spirituality, some of which I have some time for. I don't think they're necessarily pseudoscience. Mm. I don't think they're necessarily... Um, a disastrous way to to live your life and then just like harnesses them to the most kind of <clears throat> mundane like if you make enough money then you'll be happy kind of uh kind of goals which a huge amount of psychological research suggests the opposite at this point and and so it just seems mm-hmm. like it's kind of i, I think it seems yeah i mean I, I i i think it is a a, a a sad state of affairs one of the things i've always been like quite happy that i'm able to do in the kind of writing i do i suppose i am i can't i can't deny that i'm giving people advice on some level but because i've always tried to take this approach of like you know it's me going on a journey as a reporter experiencing stuff Mm. seeing what's good seeing what's Mm -hmm. bad i don't have to maintain i think anyway a a pretense that i've somehow got it all worked out and i know what i'm doing because that i think is 
something that affects a huge number of writers in this in this area and certainly the sort of you know um yeah. stadium coaches and everything yeah. they have to pretend to this absurd exactly. lack of vulnerability and and um an unbroken confidence and either it eventually cracks and they're reported in the news to be you know suffering from many many different personal problems or you just get a vibe off them that is not it's not authentic yeah. because you know that mm. that's you, a facade and, you, and we all do a lot better when we just sort of own up to our insides i think but yeah, yeah. I, I mean i talk to coaches about this when i'm training coaches all the time you've got to be yourself you know i have talked on my blog about uh campaigning for gay rights i've talked about uh, which is all no-no stuff about religion, about about really ripping the law of attraction. I've talked about the fact I used to take a lot of ecstasy and speed in my twenties <laughs> and party all the time, right. and I have a history with generalised anxiety disorder. And and people, no way is my life even close to being perfect. But a lot of mm. coaches believe there's this kind of aura that you're a life coach, so you must have all your ducks in a row. Right. Well, look. Feathery fuckers won't stay still. The minute you get a couple in the row, the other, t- you know, that's that's life basically. Yeah. Right, and the skill that you have, you know, I mean, I haven't been coached by you, but the skill that you, I assume you have is not the skill of presenting a perfect image for everyone else to copy. It's specific skills to do with the idea of coaching, you know, and, and they can be they're, exactly. they're learned and practiced, and and they can go along with having all sorts of problems. Yeah, mm. exactly. I mean, thanks for saying I've got some skills, but um, <laughs> we'll push that to one side. Olivier would beg, I'm, beg I'm, to differ. I'm, I'm not that, that sure, to be honest, but that's, that's yeah, my well, opinion. Whatever. Is, but... so, so let me tell you, did the, cause it, we, there's been obviously a lot of research on the stuff that we've been talking about. Um, apart from law of attraction, obviously there's been no fucking research on law of attraction, but that's, that's why they can, that's why you need faith to believe in it. But in terms of a positive psychology, so from Seligman and Csikszentmihalyi back in the 80s, we've learned optimism and flow and through, and now there's been uh, a lot of uh, work by people, I don't know if you're familiar with Sonia Lubomirsky. Yep, yep, uh, yep. Who's, yeah, and it's, is that the kind of, the movement that triggered it for you or was it because when you were describing it do you know dan harris's book 10 percent happier uh y- yes i don't haven't read it yet but i do know it yeah yeah I- i've not read it but it reminded me so much of you because there's a journalist yeah and there was somebody being sensible about it not you know I- i'm going to make you you know you're, you're going to fulfill every potential and you're going to live your live streams but you know what, 10% happier would be really quite nice. Yeah. Mm. And, and, and yours kind of makes me think of that. You know, it's just like just taking it from, a, from people that are a little bit worn down by being beaten over the, the head with this. Was that, so were, were you ever into that stuff, into the positive psychology, or was it just your sort of like life experiences of getting fed up of hearing about this stuff? Well, it was a mixture of, it was a mixture of both. I mean, I have done a lot of writing and, and sort of journalistic research into into positive psychology i think that there's a really important distinction to be made between positive thinking which as i define it you know is basically all bad um it doesn't include just being naturally optimistic but that sort of willed attempt to be happy in all scenarios and then positive psychology which uh although i think quite a bit of positive psychology is infected with a kind of positive thinking uh, uh, bias I-, I take that to mean at its root positive psychology is just the idea of okay let's look at the causes of happiness as well as the yeah, causes exactly. of, as well as the causes of disorders and 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 depression and and um and 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 you know all manner of bad things let's also look at the causes of good things i do think that when that gets turned into popular books a lot of the time the, the, the best advice that gets given is just like, you know, think happy thoughts. And that is not and that is um, th- that is in my target. But, you know, I, for example, there's some fascinating work being done at the moment at uh, NYU by a woman called Gabrielle Uttingen, uh, which is into yeah, the, li- the, book. the limitations. Book, yes. Right, right, right. Now, she's, she looks at the limitations of positive thinking. She looks at how visualizing successful outcomes can sometimes sap your motivation to achieve them. Yeah. And how thinking yeah. about the distance between where you are now and where you want to get to can actually be much more powerful. But to me, that's positive psychology. It's just not positive thinking. And, yeah, um, of course. Yeah. And, and that I've got an awful lot of time for because, you know, it's maybe not getting always to the deepest uh, of people's issues about why they're happy or sad in life, but it's, but it's incredibly practical and, um, and sort of evidence-based. And, you know, yeah, it's, 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 right. it's, it's great. Right, right. 
Mm -hmm. Because she was a protege of um, of Seligman's, and one thing I will say about Seligman, he always made the difference between positive thinking and optimistic thinking. Right. You know, optimistic thinking is that belief that things can get better down the road. I may not know how or whatever, but positive thinking is, oh, I've just I've just uh, lost my left foot, but no worries, I, I'll need less shoes from now on. Yes. You know, so it's kind of, yep. and, he's, and she kind of even takes it further than Seligman in, in that book, and. And she's not even sure about that element, but it's, it's, a, it's a, I'll tell you something, Oliver, it's a really uncomfortable read for somebody in my industry because it turns a lot of stuff on its head. Now, I like that, uh, but it's like, you know, she's going to be shot as bring, bringing the message and she's going to be ridiculed, <laughs> even though she's just spent a mere 20 years researching the topic. And, and <laughs> uh, <laughs> Can you give us an example, Tim, of these of these things that uh, will make us uncomfortable when well, you say that? Well, I, I think it was one of the things was just what what Oliver was saying that she basically says that when uh, they, they work with some students and when they got people to visualize. So again, you know, we talk mm. about law of attraction. When they got them to visualize everything going perfectly, um, first of all, the motivation was lower, and second of all, mm. it didn't go as well. And the reason why it didn't go as well because people only uh, only visualized everything mm. going perfect so when there were barriers or things to trip them up it kind of like they, yeah, yeah when, when other people that were like they were asked to visualize things going wrong and how they would deal with them and they mm. you know it makes perfect sense doesn't it, when you think about it yeah exactly absolutely yeah actually actually it reminds me of something of something actually it reminds me of a parallel of what you also you describe it's about the, the goal settings as well Oliver, in your book. Right, well, and I... And I, I, I yeah, I... Sorry, go on. Yeah. No, no, please, please, go on. Go on. Uh, well, I, 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 mentioned, a... I mentioned her work uh, fleetingly in that context as well, because, um, yeah, I think, well, one of the... One way that makes it sort of vivid <clears throat> is that, you know, this, this thing that you've come, read in a million self-help books about how um, your brain can't tell the difference between a thought and reality. So, therefore, if you imagine great success and being you know celebrated by everyone you know as having pulled off an amazing uh, success that's that's that will bring it into reality okay so firstly i think there's a lot of problems with the idea that your brain can't tell the difference between a thought and reality but even if it could like that wouldn't lead you to be motivated that would lead you to conclude that you'd already done what you were trying to do so you mm. might as well relax and that is actually mm. one of the findings that um emerges from from her ideas i sort of broaden that out a bit to the whole idea of the, the sort of um, uh, doctrine, the dogma of you've got to have really specific goals, you've got to have really ambitious and precise goals, and you've got to dedicate yourself relentlessly to those goals. And, you know, I don't think that goals are all bad uh, uh, in the way that I might sometimes think that certain kinds of positive thinking are all bad. But certainly a ton of evidence that, you know, when you are too fixated on one specific outcome, you can, you know, miss all sorts of interesting opportunities or other ways of achieving things that you weren't looking out for. It puts blinkers on you. Um, this, um, uh, this idea that, you know, people who are very fixated on meeting certain targets, they forget about how their goals all interact with each other. So, you know, it's not, you may claim you want to be a millionaire at age 20, but like if that causes you to be almost, to destroy your health and be almost dead, then mm. probably that wasn't right. something that you actually wanted to aim for because those two goals are actually interconnected in ways you didn't think. And yeah. Um, yeah. and I have a lot of fun with that that um, that famous uh, alleged Yale study of goals. Oh, that, I'm uh, so glad you brought this up. <laughs> that, I was about uh, to bring it up. Yes, yeah. go, go for it. Go for it. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. want me to talk about it or do you guys want to describe yeah, no, it? No, 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 no. no, 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 no please go, go, go ahead. ahead. Okay, well, this is this famous study that occurs in... Uh, in a, a very large number of books of self-help books on goal setting about how the um let me get this right i think it was the, the graduating class of yale university in 1953 um were asked how many of them had uh, specific and uh, written down goals for the rest of their lives and only three percent of them said that they did 20 years later the researchers uh the story goes caught up with this same uh, bunch of people and found that the three percent who had written down goals had made more uh, financial wealth among them than the other 97% combined. Mm. And it's incredibly powerful uh, 
um, mm. story. It's just completely made up, as far as anyone can tell. Yeah. It's, it's become a total. It's a total. It never happened. I've, I've written about it a couple it, of it's, times. It's, um, I, I was the, the first person to really do the research into this was a, was a journalist on Fast Company magazine a bunch of years ago. But I replicated a bit of this. I rang Yale archivists. I got them to look into it. I, I put out some feelers to see if it. Sometimes it's allegedly a Harvard Business School study instead. So I was talking to them to try to track down whether this had ever happened and. When this guy from Fast Company years ago asked um, one of the self-help gurus who quotes it a lot where he got it from, he suggested asking another famous self-help guru. And he asked that guy, and it's like, you know, Tony Robbins, Brian Tracy, whatever. They go around in a circle. Eventually, the circle closes up again, and they're all just saying, oh, I think I got it from this other guy. And they're like, it doesn't come from anywhere, because actually, there is no such evidence that... um, written down goals make and, and specific goals make such yeah. a ridiculously large contribution they they have their uses absolutely but uh, they're not they're not magic yeah and, and, but the, be- the best quote of the lot was actually uh, when brian tracy was told that said this you know this because he talks about it a lot yeah when he was told about it and said it never existed his response was well, it should have. <laughs> and he carries on st- st- still using it. And, and actually, like, for, you know, let's, there's let's, some. There was an attempt at the university recently to to approximately replicate, not on a twenty year scale or anything like that, but to look at it. And you know, they do find some 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 modest benefits, as I recall, for for having some clear goals and for people who have none at all and don't know what they're doing putting the thought into thinking out where you'd like to be in you know a few months or a year or two is is great but it's um but you can really engage in in what's in the book anyways uh, quoting someone else i call the over pursuit of goals you can really um you can really be too fixated on them well you haven't got any um you're you're talking to two life coaches and I haven't got any written goals down. Uh, I don't really believe in them. And uh, even though I'll talk to goal setting about uh, with, with clients, and I'll explain it in a minute if I may, but uh, Olivia, you haven't got any, have you? Am I right in saying that? You no, no. Goals? And first of all, I don't call myself life coach. You, you are the only one to call yourself life coach. <laughs> uh, it's because nobody else, it's nobody, I don't know what else to call myself. I can't call myself <coughs> grumpy arrogant uh, uh, dick bold, you know, bold, people, bold, bold. yeah know. people aren't going to hire me on that I'll be searching Google but what, one of the things that I, I, I the, one of the issues that I have with goals so like the SMART method which is just, um, um, specific measurable achievable uh, um, uh, realistic and time bound what it, it misses out two crucial elements as far as I'm concerned and this is where I think this is where Goal, goal setting can go to a different level and be more useful and that's people's values so you say about somebody wanting yeah. to earn a million dollars let's suppose in, I had uh, a guy come and say to me as a client I want to earn 10 million dollars now that doesn't tell me anything about him as a person because he might want to earn 10 million dollars so he could hire a butler and abuse him and uh, basically mock and ridicule all the people that haven't got any money or whatever and on the opposite extreme, it maybe he wants to earn ten million dollars because he wants to give back. He wants to start a charitable foundation or something. So, without taking that a person's a person's personal values into consideration yeah. with goals, and so so I rather smugly called them smarter goals. And the E is for environment, and the environment is exactly what you just said. Yeah, you've got to understand how your goals impact on. The each other mm-hmm. and also the people around you. Yeah. If you've got a family of five, you know, and you've got a massive great mortgage, you've got a goal that you want to be a professional blogger, that you know, you're probably going to fail at it. You, you've got to take that into consideration. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's where people trip up on it. It's just like this, yeah, let's write them down and go for it and that's it. And and then wonder why they fail. You're laughing at me, aren't you? <laughs> Lavar. Yes you are. I, uh, of course I am. I, of course I am. I like, I like your passion. But what you said, actually, I agreed with you because I like the values. The values. It's. Uh, I think it's all the essence of, of coaching is actually is to mm-hmm. define the values of, of everyone. I think that's the, the key thing, you know, and to find this based on the values, your authenticity, your voice, you know, and let yourself be really as you are. But I had. A, 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 I was extremely curious actually uh, about Oliver because he met. Uh, you met Ed Cartolli, Oliver, right? Yes. For, yeah, so I r- I'm really curious. How is he in person? I was, um, 
I I had sort of visions in my mind before I went to uh, <laughs> meet him. So firstly, I you know, firstly you sort of assume that he'll have um, somehow found his way to India because that's where people do guru like things. And secondly, that uh, he'll be surrounded by followers and you know, uh, uh, in living in these in- incredibly uh, wealthy circumstances and it's funny i kind of assumed that even without thinking that if that were true it would have detracted from his um message i don't know why i thought that i guess i just assumed that that's what happens to uh, like uh, big uh, spiritual guys anyway he lives in vancouver in, in canada um in a um uh in an apartment near the university of british columbia it's nice but it's not um it's not uh you know uh ostentatiously nice at all um and as far as I can tell, he has a very small organization around him, you know, somebody to people in charge of the, the rights and publications and everything. But he he is really quite an extraordinary person. Like I like he just sort of exudes what you maybe think from reading The Power of Now, from seeing him talk and video and everything. Mm-hmm. He, he, he would, which is this kind of absolute stillness and even more than stillness, I want to say, like just okayness with them. Um, with how things are right now. And it's kind of awkward at the beginning because um, uh, <laughs> I'm not okay with long silences in, in, in conversations or I'm, you know, I'm less okay with them than he is. So you sort of meet someone like this to interview them. And uh, firstly, you kind of feel like you have to say something. He'll just sit there smiling uh, perfectly happily. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and then you have things to say. And then all the questions you come up with, like, seem to make no sense and you get really self-critical so like it's like you know i often say to people i'm interviewing i thank them for sparing the time to um talk to me but but he's all i've just read his book on the way in again telling me that there's only the eternal present so i'm not sure that uh uh time is really such an issue anyway it, it grows on you after a while and he was very very interesting he was very open to being asked you know skeptical questions about the, the transformation that he says happened to him at uh, in his late 20s when he sort of um uh, underwent this kind of uh, this this kind of inner transformation and and sort of skeptical questions about how to integrate the kind of perspective that he talks about into a sort of ordinary busy uh life and it was kind of it, it was it was pretty amazing it was um it wasn't so much what he said to me in the interview, given that I'd already read his work and everything. It was that there was something there was something about being in the same presence as somebody who was so completely OK with where, with everything right now. You know, and it really draws attention to the degree mm. to which uh, most of us probably aren't most of the time in that state. Well, can, can I just say I'm, I'm throwing a bit of a wobbly here. Because I'm I'm desperately searching on Google who the fuck is Ed Cartoli, and uh, are we pronouncing him in a way that's so difficult? unfair <laughs> for you to make me look so foolish. Eckhart uh, Tolle. I'm sure, there's other, I'm sure there's other people listening. That, no, it's what? Sorry, Eckhart Tolle is. He's the author of a book called The Power of Now, and there's some dispute about the pronunciation of his last name. So maybe you have heard of him, but but not with uh, that pronunciation. Um, e c k h a r t. Second name. Oh, Eckhart Tolle. There you go. I've got sick team. You know sorry. him. I've got sorry. 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 Listen. Sorry. I, I've got. I've got in Google Ed Cartoli, <laughs> and and I found this gangster. But uh, sorry. <laughs> this is why I call you. I know. I know. I think I you're humiliated feel, for. I, I think. I feel so <laughs> yes, the power now and new earth. Okay, no, it's totally legitimate. Somebody, Ooh. people, someone listening may well not have heard of him. Um, he's a he's a, a, a spiritual teacher, a sort of new age type yeah. uh, spiritual teacher, and to be honest, the kind of person who I would have approached with a certain amount of cynicism and skepticism. But I I wanted to put him in there, you know, partly to look at this whole idea of being present in the now and not always trying to get forward towards better times and also because i think you know one of the big discoveries for me of doing all this kind of work is that is that um there may be a lot of rubbish in the mind body spirit section of the of the bookstore and there really is but that's not quite the same as saying that it's all rubbish and you can actually it's almost just as problematic to go around assuming that it's all rubbish as it is to go around assuming that it's all true yeah, Actually, that's, a, that's a good question uh, because you say there's a lot of rubbish, and, but there's also true part of it. So what what is true here? Okay, maybe it's very, you know, that w- what do you believe in here in this in this uh, industry? Then 
I think one of the things that always interests me is this question of pseudoscience. You know, a lot of a lot of stuff is attacked and quite rightly as being uh, pseudoscientific. Um, but I don't. I think we need to be careful not to condemn everything that isn't. Uh, established research as pseudoscience. Some of it is because it's pretending to be scientifically credible. If you read a book like The Power of Now, with very few exceptions, it's just not, it just doesn't belong to a genre that is making certain factual claims about populations of people's psychological functioning, you know, in a way that I think a lot of the law of attraction stuff does make a claim. It says, you know, if you do this, this will happen. And actually, to the extent that that's ever been tested in the laboratory setting, if you do that, it doesn't happen. But when Eckhart Tolle says, you know, you should try looking inside and listening to the voices that are in your mind and and asking yourself the question, you know, am I that voice or am I not that voice? You know, that's not a that's not pseudoscience mm-hmm. because it's not even pretending to be science. It's a sort of introspective uh, exercise in the same way that we don't condemn poetry or painting for being pseudoscience because you know mm. it's not it's not trying to be science and i think that kind of spiritual writing that sort of sets out to have a certain kind of effect on you has a lot of validity the kind that says you know the physical universe is a certain way but i haven't got any evidence for this claim i mean that's uh, that's a lot more problematic mm. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I do think Tolle's got probably more credibility than the, than the vast majority of writers on on the subject because what you said, you know, he's obviously had a charisma bypass operation, and, and, and I, I foolishly bought his books on audio book, and I couldn't <laughs> listen to him while I was driving because he was sending me to sleep. But <laughs> he, he says a lot of very very sensible stuff. He doesn't, you know, he's not going to get into the Deepak Chopra, Richard Dawkins conversation about quantum physics you know right um, right uh, uh, but but i also think it's it's one of those books when i when i've done stuff on facebook ask people what's the book that most influenced you and that's the book that nearly always is the most popular yeah if that was the case the world would be such a different place it sold tens of millions mm-hmm. of copies yeah but i'm not mm-hmm. sure most people are ready to grasp it it's, it's very much it's like it's like to me it's like buddhism the you know, the Buddhism expressed in the six element practice, this is not me, I am not this. Uh, sorry, this is not me, this is not mine, I am not this. Yeah. When we're thinking about no, nothing is, is ours. Yeah. And, and I kind of get, but it's, it's easy to get it at, a, at an intellectual level, <clears throat> but mm. it doesn't sit well with how we evolutionary have uh, evolved as human beings. It's just like, but there is a me, do you know what I mean? That's how we're brought mm. up. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely, and I think you're right. I think that I think that there's also no harm in some of these philosophies acting as a as a as a small counter pressure. You know <laughs> that um, obviously someone like Eckhart Tolle has gone through or says he went through a, a total one-off transformation of his personality, and this is something that certain Buddhist traditions, especially the sort of Zen tradition, places a great mm-hmm. emphasis on. This idea of you'll suddenly see and everything will be different. But if people buy The Power of Now and let it sort of seep into them and it reminds them just a little bit to not live their entire life as if the really important moment is about three years away or two weeks away, yeah. um, then I think that's fine. You know, I think if that's a little bit of a break on our natural um, goal-seeking tendencies, then I think you know, I'm all for that. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I agree. I mean, and also, it was on Oprah, so it must be credible. She, <laughs> she, she only had credible people. After all, she had like Wayne, the secret. Yeah, Wayne Dyer. <laughs> and I watched a video by John DiMartini. A, a client sent it me. He said, "You're going to like this because he talks about values." And, and are you familiar with him? No, I'm John not. DiMartini I'm not. From, he, he was in the secret. Is it? Oh, right. He's Dr. John Martini. He's actually a chiropractor. Right. And on, honestly, I wanted to shove my head through the computer screen after about 10 minutes. I, I'd, I'd stop taking notes of what things that he was actually wrong about. But he, because he's, you know, even chiropractors go through a certain amount of medical training. So he was using a lot of words and authority. Yeah. And, and people believe it because he sounded, if he didn't know any different, you would say the guy sounds plausible and he knows what he's talking about. Yeah. The fact that a lot of it was bluster and confidence. It's a bit like the people, all the people in the secret. I mean, you know, you've got the the uh, James. What is it that ended up doing two years for killing people at the sweat lodge? You've you've got um, b- b- 
run through is obviously mad as a March hare that had been drinking mercury for two years, and then, you know, and, and and just and they've all gone their own way, and they all and Joe Vitale, who this he, this Joe Vitale is the greatest law of attraction expert on the planet, apparently, but. Can't he fucking manifest a, like a 32 inch waistline and a full head of hair if he's that good at it? Because, <laughs> you know, I would have thought your, your health's a bit more important, mate. You need to cut down on, on the pies. Anyway, I'm getting. The, the, men, the, the go, go back here, to I compassion, mean, men. The thing that this is a reminder, obviously, the problem is on the one hand, I actually don't. On the one hand, you've got to be incredibly careful of, um, of this kind of stuff. You've absolutely not going to put yourself in a position where you're in a sweat lodge in the desert with somebody who doesn't understand basic health and safety. On the other hand, you, you really don't, I think, want to start saying that very narrowly defined, scientifically credible forms of um, psychological intervention, you know, CBT and um, a, a few little bits of positive psychology are the only things people want to explore because actually, you know, there is there is something valid in sort of pursuing certain spiritual traditions just out of curiosity and interest mm. and they and they sometimes do mm. they are sometimes true in a sort of relative way for, for individual people so all this is a reminder of is that like you've just absolutely got to never um give away your own authority about yourself to to somebody else completely you've got to never become right. a a, 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 a mm. total follower of anybody or anything you've got to you've got to remember that like you know it's up to you what you're pursuing, and um, and and whether it's working for you or not, and and um, and, and you know anything else is is pretty dangerous. It's I mean, literally potentially dangerous in some of those cases. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you you were saying how you got carried away a little bit in the at the event that you went to, and that when that group think kicks in, and that's just fantastic. I'm so glad that my phone that nobody knows the number to. <laughs> uh, it, Sorry about that, don't you? <laughs> Oh, You're so professional cool. right now, Tim. It's yeah, amazing. Yeah, no way. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. I am. This is this is the peak. I I I, I am peaking <laughs> on my professionalism, and I can't remember what I was saying now. And it was it was possibly the most important point I have ever made. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah what were we so, talking so about? Oh yeah, no. I was just about the group thinking. It's very easy to get. You know. But there's some. I, I don't know if you've ever, either of you guys, have read uh, Robert Cialdini's Influence. Yeah, um, yeah. He's kind of been ra raped and pillaged over the last 20 years by a load of other books where they've taken bit different stories about. But there was the one where the people went to to see. Um, it was something to do with a, um, a a meditation retreat that they were trying to sell, but it wasn't like traditional meditation. I think it may have been even. Um, uh, what's, it, what's it called, uh, Harry Krishna or whatever. So basically the people were there and um, this guy, uh, Cialdini, had gone with a friend of his who's a, who was a neuroscientist and, and, and other stuff and what have you. And this guy did the speech and explained all this and, and, and this, uh, his friend put his hand up and said, could I speak? He said, yeah. And he said, he then spent 15 minutes explaining why everything he just said was wrong and couldn't possibly work. <laughs> And they actually ended up getting more people, sat, more people were rushing. And he came to the conclusion, people just want hope. Yeah. That the minute mm. you try to take hope away from them, they actually rebel. It's like when the, it, it happened in Spain in last century or whatever, where the, the, the guy had collected 10,000 people on a mountaintop, they were going to be flown away by, by the aliens or whatever, and they didn't, t they didn't turn up. So he just said... Oh, fuck it, sorry, I got the date wrong. I wrote, wrote it down in ICAL <laughs> wrong. It's next week, and 50,000 people turned up. So after being proved wrong once, and it's kind of... <laughs> we're all <laughs> fucked up, <laughs> aren't we? I mean... <laughs> yeah, I think that, you know, this is... this. I, I don't know if this is quite staying exactly on topic, but but um, but it the, the where it connects to what I'm really hoping to get across in... in in the stuff I've written and, you know, just the stuff I'm interested in is this idea that being more open to different emotions and thoughts, to things working and not working, to, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. sad thoughts as well as happy thoughts, is it's actually a very resilient and hopeful way to be. It isn't about resigning yourself to things. It's about sort of, you know, I'm, I'm struggling to express this, but, you know, in the case of these kind of people making grand promises and crazy seeming promises they can only really do it if 
on it can only really work on people who <clears throat> have a very sort of all or nothing mindset about everything that they're that they're doing and if you are sort of able to approach good and bad stuff if you're not totally blown off course by a negative thought but you're also not totally you know besotted by a, a specific goal if you have this kind of steady and level way of moving forward it's not boring or 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 resigned it's actually an incredible way of um you know mm-hmm. just just going forward and doing stuff i've been reading and actually writing at the moment about this some approaches from japanese psychology that really uh, focus on this idea of discomfort and how much we will do to avoid mm. feelings of discomfort even though the feelings of discomfort are not that bad it's not like avoiding you know severe pain right. or something but we'll actually yeah. like yeah. call off all sorts of plans just because we can't feel great while we're putting them into practice and i think there's a lot of power in that in that general sort of idea anyway sorry yeah uh, no no i, I, I agree <laughs> And I think uh, I'm going to talk over Olivier for the 17th time by saying that's exactly the Buddhist philosophy, though, isn't it? It's to, you know, non-grasping and, like, every, everything is transient. Good, good, you know, good thoughts come and good feelings come and they go and, and negative ones come everything, and, you know, and it's just Everything okay. is in permanence. In permanence, indeed. So, in sorry, permanence. my French friend, you, you, you go on. I, I, I have, I have no, abused you enough for one right. day. No, no, this is what you do. This is, this is your role, is to talk a lot. But mm. uh, one thing that you said, Oliver, and, and really this is what, you know, what I like is, and you mentioned it just before, is to say that you should also be open to dark thoughts, right? Right. And you even, you know, and this is one thing that I loved in this book. You, you finish with the book with, uh, with uh, the chapter, which is a Momento Mori, which is you should also think about death. Right. Right. Which is also also a power. It it will help you. And, you know, every time there's one thing that that I I, I just just drives me mad. Every every day I open my Facebook accounts and obviously I can see teams posting stuff and shit. But every day somebody (laughs) will post these very optimistic quotes from someone. Yeah. I've never seen anyone. You know, posting like something. Okay, by the way, you all die soon, and na na na. Except one of uh, our guests that we had. But it it seems that this this negativity, we just forbidden ourselves to go there. And and this idea, even that you you, sh- you sh- even by by thinking about death, it can help you. That's that's so cool, actually. Yeah. I I I've written about it, mate. You obviously no, you don't, don't read my blog because I wrote no, a blog. No. It was something. It was something like six thousand days and counting. And about the fact that you're all going to die, I've, I, I regularly. I mean, there's, death the, 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 there's two ways of thinking about it, isn't there? There's like there's there's the idea that it's actually good to dwell on this on this topic because of the urgency that it lends to clarifying, you know, making sure you're spending mm. your precious little time on on something that matters to you. And then there's just this sense of like, mm. well, for now, until they figure something out, you are going to die. So. So it's really just a question of not shying away from a fact. And I think that um, that is, you know, that has even wider relevance. Just that idea that, like, you basically never do well to to ignore uh, or try not to uh, notice aspects of uh, of, of reality, basically. And uh, and uh, death is yeah. sort of the, the hardest one. And it was amazing, you know, going to Mexico and spending time with people who were, like, very deliberately trying to focus on the whole idea of of death i was deliberately trying to sort of jump start my own uh, uh, uh um focus in in that way but but any level of it's taking off now these things this organization called um death cafe that um is meeting up in yeah. places around the world uh holding these kind of pop-up gatherings to just chat about death and eat cakes um and it's literally this uh this idea of yeah, you know, it literally can just be a subject of of, of idle conversation because we all end up talking about it in life, but only when we can't avoid it because it's happening to somebody or it's happened to somebody close to us. And there's something very powerful about doing it when you when you when you don't need to, you know, thinking about death when you don't need to. Was Eddie's had anything to do with it by any chance? I mean, because you mentioned cake and death, <laughs> and I was in, I was immediately at the cake or death. I love. Well, we're out of, well, we're out of cake. You're going to have to have death. Um, but you also, you, you, you said something then that just 
something jumped into my mind like a, a, an aha moment in terms of just demonstrating what you're saying. So my both my parents are, are, are dead now, but my wife's parents, we've just been back to the UK for Christmas to see them. And um, my uh, father-in-law is 80, is in great shape for 80, or at least it seems, you never know, sure. My mother-in-law is 72, I think. She would not discuss the thought of him not being there. She won't even allow him to show her where everything's kept in terms of the finances, how to pay bills, just shuts it out, shuts it down. And mm. I, I have no idea what's going to happen if he, if he suddenly drops dead and hopefully he won't, he's a lovely guy, but you know, at 80, it can happen at any, well, it can happen at any time, full stop. Right. It, it's going to make the situation exponentially worse because there's that then massive stress and that we, because it's, it's a societal thing, isn't it? Because there are other yeah. societies where they, they, they've no problem talking about death, certainly in a, a lot of Asia, the, the Indian subcontinent, etc. Yes. Um, and that is a... Yeah, that's interesting. There's a whole... Yeah. Um, there's a whole. I'm just looking to see if I can find it right now, but there's a whole... Um, and I can't, of course, but there's, a, but there's a, 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 a whole sort of movement that is starting to try to encourage, you know, yeah. uh, ways for people to talk about this stuff with their parents and and with each other you know it's, it's actually you know i think people i think there's a lot of superstition people think that like you know you somehow invite death into yeah. your household by mentioning it but as with almost everything in life from you know death down to you know smaller relationship troubles down to just not wanting to check your bank balance because you're a bit worried that you've got less money than you think you have whatever Doing it is empowering every time, you know, and you always end up yes. feeling mm. better for having seized control of the situation in that way because what we, you know, that sense of agency is much more powerful than, than almost always than the, than the bad news that could result from, uh, from, from doing it, yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah I, I agree. I think there's also the element with some people that uh, kids, you know, like my, well, I say kids, my wife is 46 and her sister's 42, there's that element of it. Uh, Mum and Dad, we need to talk about your will. Yeah. <laughs> Who's getting what? You know, yeah, let's sit yeah. down. And so I think there's a, a certain, especially in families when, yeah, you know, my family, we talk about money. It was never an issue. But in their family, they just don't talk about money. And it's kind of like, I think there's that sort of, um, you know, that, that, that barrier as well. Yeah, um, yeah, no, absolutely. It's not easy. And, I, and you know, th that's always a risk that, I've, uh, that I'm in, I think, talking about some of this stuff is uh, making it sound like... Um, like confronting negative things is uh, is is super easy, and you know I'm quite sure that the worst moments and bereavements in my life and everything have all yet to come. So who knows whether my these life philosophies that I'm talking about will will stand up to the test? I have a hunch that they're the right ones to be going into the next part of my life with, but you know you can always put these things to an even more severe test than you uh, than you have so far. Sure, but but human beings are far better at adapting and dealing with circumstances than they think they'll be. Yes, that too, absolutely, you know, you, yeah, no, we're, totally. We're awesome at adapting. You, know, you see people, and my wife's an oncologist, you see people like, that. Oh, I, I could never go through something like that. And yeah, you could, because there's no choice. Yeah, mm, and yeah. And you adapt, and the, and the body, yeah. and it's not fun. Yeah. And in, interestingly enough, a, a high percentage of cancer recovery patients, if you gave me the opportunity to have never had the cancer in the first place, wouldn't take, you up on that yeah. opportunity which is yeah. again shows you know sometimes these things that you know make people stronger or they can make way listen I, I want to I just want to ask you a question just off topic completely if I'm amazed since we're getting toward the end of time I know we've run over a little bit because yeah. you, you work for the, the, the Guardian and when uh, Olivier mentioned your name I just I know that name I know that name and I went and saw you wrote for the Guardian <laughs> so I, I want to personally thank you and I know it's got nothing to do with you I was brought up in a very Tory household where we had the Daily Telegraph and um, I, I don't know what happened in, when I got into my early 20s but I suddenly started buying the Guardian and realised and I'd been reading a load of bullshit for the last 10 years and I didn't know what I was talking about so uh, at the time I, I went from being a Thatcher supporter to a raving left-wing lunatic and I don't quite as far as Derek Hatton but um, certainly uh, that way and I'm, I'm a bit more sort of settled now but uh, that, was the, that was down to the Guardian so thank you a, a great newspaper um, I'll take all the credit and while I'm at it I think it was you I think it was you I just like Even to take you only need about six at the time yeah 
I'd like to take all the credit for the um, the Edward Snowden story, the phone hacking story, all the all the amazing uh, scoops that my colleagues have been responsible for, and that I've had absolutely nothing to do with uh, over the last few years. I'm very happy to take credit for them all. Yeah. Right, and the typos. <laughs> yeah, no, Olivia, sure, why not? Olivia, why not? You wouldn't know this. <laughs> Olivia, you wouldn't know this, but the, the Guardian had a terrible reputation. There wasn't a newspaper, oh, really? that ca- there wasn't an edition that came out that didn't have a few typos, and some of them, <coughs> some of them were, were quite funny. They appeared in Private Eye, a satirical magazine, and but, more. But, but I think, I think uh, you know, what, one scoop that left Oliver for you to do is to discover, you know, the ultimate way to be happy, right? And this is, this is your... Uh, your mission, I guess, or your scoop for the future. I don't know if I... I, I, I don't know. I feel like I've, I've sort of... Um, I've sort of changed the mandate of this column I've been writing over the, over the time I've been doing it. Um, I started off sceptically addressing self-help, but you don't want to just sound a single note forever. So now I've sort of, you know, I sort of jumped off into all manner of kind of philosophical stuff and, and, um, and sort of... Uh, intriguing ideas. I guess ultimately, it's all about being happy because everything is, and by some <laughs> by some definition. But um, you know, I'd hope that I would keep a definition of that that was expansive enough to include uh, not only the sort of negative stuff, but but a sort of bigger social perspective. And you know, it's uh, and uh, and you know, yeah. Who knows? I guess you know, if I could find my life purpose uh, before I die, that would be awesome. Right, so okay, okay. there's no point finding it afterwards, mate. <laughs> you should, you should, you should hire Tim as a coach. Is is I've heard that he's kind of good, but I'm not. I'm not yeah, sure. yeah. But, uh, I, I I don't think I. I, I have no doubt. Podcast. Uh, what was that? I have no doubt. Yes. Right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, you should. You should. Are you working on another book, by the way? Just as a fan, actually. Are you are, are you writing, writing another book? I, I'm 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 sort of trying to be at the early stages of it yet. Yes, very early stages, and I'm I'm too um I'm 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 too coy about it at this point to talk about it because I feel like if I if I try and release my uh, embryonic ideas into the air, they won't uh, they won't survive. But yes, I am just about is the answer to that question. Okay. I'll just make just make sure well, you bring the law of attraction there. And <laughs> Oliver's going to close it down, but I want to ask you one more thing. You oh, yeah. you you are based in DC, aren't you? Uh, um, New York, actually, Brooklyn. Oh, New York. I beg your pardon. How do you find living in the US? One of the things before I moved to the US, I spent a lot of time here with work and on vacations and stuff, but I don't think I was quite ready for the difference in cultures. And I just wondered how you like it, how you compare New York, say, to London. It's interesting. I get the strong sense that I do not really live in America, even though I live in Brooklyn, uh, New York. Um, So it is very different in many ways. But on the other hand, um, you know, this feels like, to some extent, it does feel like an extension of uh, of London to to to, to some mm-hmm. extent. Um, mm-hmm. There's a there's a huge number of Brits. There's a sort of sensibility that feels very much like my sensibility. I don't know how I would uh, be on, say, the West Coast. Um, I think that could be um, that could be very different. Um, uh, but you know, I, I mean, I I I'd love it. I moved here because I was sort of there was something about that kind of. Um, that there was something about it that was very exciting and that has not gone away <laughs> Brooklyn is a kind of for all the cliches about us eating our artisanal um, uh, you know pickles and the things that we do here in uh, in hipster Brooklyn it is kind of it does it does have a wonderful kind of scale as a, as a set of neighborhoods and as a community I really uh, I really enjoy it quite a lot I, I come from the north of England so I was always a bit down on London but uh, oh, where about? York I grew up in York uh, I was in, from Derbyshire, so North Derbyshire. Oh, very interesting. <laughs> Are you thinking of moving, Tim, from Florida? <laughs> no, no, I mean, the, the thing is, uh, and I get that, so, you know, if, if I was to name my favourite cities in, in the US, it would be San Francisco, New Orleans, Key West, and New York. And the one thing they've all got in common is you actually don't feel like you're in America, <laughs> uh, especially with the first three. They're a lot more bohemian, they're a lot more European, they're a lot more... I wouldn't say New York's relaxed, but the other three are a lot more relaxed. Whereas round here, you know, you, I'm in Orlando, which is a very metropolitan city, but you go 
25 <laughs> miles in any particular uh, direction and you're into possum fucking country. You yes. know, and it's like, here's my <laughs> wife and my sister and my daughter and there's only one person there. Seriously, it's, it's, it's very much like that. I hope fucking hell, I hope there's nobody listening from around here. I think I've just <laughs> shot any chance of ever getting any local Do you have guns at home? Or, 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 I, I've never been hired by anybody in a, in a red check shirt and a, and a pickle with Muslims go home written on the back of his pickle. <laughs> Let's not go there. We've already done that in previous po- podcast. Yeah, I know. So, uh, well, let, let me close it up because actually okay. we're going over this hour. But Oliver, for me, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a real pleasure. If you would have asked me two years ago, if I had, you know, after buying this book, but I had the chance to, to, to yeah, and I'm, I'm kissing ass right now. And Tim <laughs> yeah, I know, I can hear. But... but <laughs> but uh, really, that, that actually, when I, I was see, uh, looking at all the different covers with all these guys smiling and all this kind of stuff, finding your book, that was really helping me, actually. But, uh, yeah. Well, thank you. I, I do appreciate that, even if, you are, even if it is uh, ass-kissing. I do, I do, um, it does make a difference when you spend your time writing stuff to know that it doesn't just like you know, evaporate out into the ether, but connects with the people and their thoughts and experiences and stuff so I do appreciate that just to be totally and, honest and I, am go- I am going to go and buy it and I, I will read it because it's definitely my, my kind, kind of thing because um, I think books like this need exposing you know, that's why I, I did the Gab- Gabriel Ottinger the review on that because I think it's important that people don't keep get, getting sucked into these self-development urban myths that uh, <coughs> there's no way out of so I have thoroughly enjoyed uh, um, letting you listen to me talk, which was fantastic. <laughs> Thank you, for both of you. Uh, we are expect- working on that, though. I, I, I am. I'm working on to just dominate even more. Today, my guest is myself, and uh, no, um, uh, and yeah, I will look forward to the follow back on Twitter. I go, look, I've got somebody that's certified or twenty-five thousand followers that's following me. Um, and yeah, good luck with what, what you did. If you do, when your book does come out, because this podcast is going to take off, because Olivia actually got his finger out and brought in some great guests, you included. Uh, he does kiss ass, but it's because he brings in people he really admires and likes. So I've no problem with ass kicking if it's somebody ass kissing if it's somebody that you, you really like. I'd ass kiss the Dalai Lama. It might feel a bit awkward. <laughs> your, your, hom- your holiness, I love you. You know, but yeah. You know, you, you know, you know what I'm saying. So, uh, yeah, th- <laughs> thanks a lot, Alu. Uh, I'll it. It was, uh, really enjoyed having you on. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks very much for asking me. Okay, cool. Okay. okay. So I'm just closing the recording, right? I'm gonna-